G'day everybody, where's Wally here? Well, today I'm going to do a little quick cheat because I'm just going to mirror a brilliant video from Scott Manley. Now, this thing is just amazing and can, warning if you're a flatty, a lot of hurt in this one. He has taken images from Discover and basically done a little bit of computer software and he stabilized them all so that at uh, noon GMT he's watched the whole planet sitting there nicely. But what you see around the three minute mark, maybe a little bit longer due to my pumping it out here, is how the earth moves up and down, in and out, basically all the libations and all that sort of stuff. The same sort of thing we see when we look at the moon over time. But anyway, I'll let Scott explain it and just enjoy this lovely bit of footage. Oh, and I'm very sad that Discover is broken at the moment. Hope they can get it fixed. Hello, it's Scott Manley here, and this is a video I've constructed for using data from Discover, the Deep Space Climate Observatory. Now, this is a spacecraft which sits at the Lagrange point between the Earth and the Sun, and it performs two functions. First of all, it is supposed to actually monitor solar wind and solar magnetic fields, because this is the primary uh, early warning system for solar storms. Knowing when a solar storm is coming in is critically important, not just to the civilian satellites, but to the US military. But that also makes it a perfect place to get a always sunlit side of Earth using the Earth Polychromatic Imaging Camera, or EPIC. This is a high zoom camera because it has to take an image of the Earth from a million miles away. It takes images every couple of hours, and it also captures rare events, such as this solar eclipse showing the shadow of the moon passing in front of the sun. Even better, there's a great sequence here where it captures the dark side of the moon as it passes in front of the sun. This is great because it lets you, tell, lets you see how uh, dark the moon is compared to the surface of the Earth. Of course, while we are admiring the data for its, well, beauty, it actually has real scientific uses. And that's kind of why they only take an image every couple of hours because that's what they need for their science. But to make a nice, smooth, rotating image of the Earth, I decided that I wanted to do something special. So I wrote software. From the image, you know the location of the Earth. You know how fast the Earth spins. So you can actually take two images and interpolate them. And this is an example of it running. What I'm doing is I'm taking the two images which are closest to the time and orientation that I want and I map both of those onto a virtual sphere and then rotate them and merge them and this is what you get. So it mostly works pretty well, but you can see that the clouds sometimes just blur from one orientation to another. The other giveaway is the uh, reflective spot, right? See the sub-solar spot where you get a lot of reflection? That hops along rather than smoothly moving across the surface. You can actually get a better idea of what I'm doing with some of the frames which uh, didn't quite work out. So here's two images where the time between them is almost 12 hours. So you can see that I've kind of got one on one side of the Earth, one on the other, and there's a small overlap in the middle and it, it's a dead giveaway. But those are actually surprisingly rare. So what I wanted to do was show the Earth at a constant orientation, or rather a constant time. So this is a, essentially manufacturing the photo that would have been taken at midday Greenwich Mean Time every single day for the entire uh, mission duration. And so I have to interpolate between two orientations. Now, what you're going to see here is that the Earth moves in and out. The, uh, the orientation moves up and down and it moves left to right. So first of all, it moves up and down because the Earth, of course, has an axial tilt and we are seeing the seasons here. But also the Earth moves in and out because while it's supposed to sit at this Lagrange point, the L1 point between the Earth and the Sun, it doesn't quite sit there. What it does is it orbits this. And on the right side, you can actually see tracks. Uh, there's, there's three different diagrams here. You've got a top one which shows the actual scale with the Earth being at the far end and the satellite being at the other end. And you see it moving up and down across the orbit. The next one down is zooms in on the vertical motion of the satellite uh, in that section. And the bottom one shows the satellite or the spacecraft essentially processing or orbiting around that Lagrange point between the Earth. So this is looking towards the Earth on the very bottom one. And that little blue circle in the middle, that is the Earth 
to scale here. So while this is primarily a beautiful rendering of the Earth as it changes through the year, it also is a great illustration of how spacecraft sitting at the L1 point or other Lagrange points will actually not stay still, how they will move around. And it is, finally, a, a tribute to Discover, which is one of my favourite missions because it has this very simple idea of just showing the Earth continuously. So you could browse to a web page and always see what it was. Until June, when it stopped working, and we haven't had any updates since then. Unfortunately, Discover has been one of these missions that has been politically inconvenient. It was built during one administration, it was all ready to launch, and then when the powers that be changed, it got put in a warehouse and sat there for 10 years until the political winds changed again and it got launched on a Falcon 9 rocket. That Falcon 9 was going to perform one of the first landing attempts on a barge, but the weather was too bad, so the, you know, the spacecraft, the, the rocket landed and missed it. But as of right now, it's also the closest thing to an interplanetary mission that has been launched on a SpaceX rocket. I had hoped that we would get more information this week because they had their annual users meeting essentially at Goddard Space Flight Center. But uh, nothing has come out of that that's given us any hope that they will get the spacecraft back online. So instead, we have this great history of this series. and. If they put another spacecraft up to replace it, I dearly hope that it includes this instrument because it is one of my favourite pieces of space hardware ever. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.